Today, we're going to look at uh, material for exam eight, that is chapter 16 in your book on assets and bases. So I'll start by sharing the PowerPoints. They're in here somewhere. Uh, well, no, they're not. Yes. And turn this into a slideshow. There we go. All right. <clears throat> We've studied uh, gases and we studied a number of other things, but um, especially for the life sciences, acids and bases, and understanding of acids and bases, even the most basic level um, is is valuable beyond measure because so many of the reactions in the in the body are uh, if not directly attributed to acid-base chemistry are mediated by acid-base chemistry uh, many are also this second class the redox reactions and uh, we'll get into that for the the very final chapter we're going to study, chapter 18. But for for now, we're we're in chapter 16 with acids and bases. Okay, <clears throat> an understanding of acids and bases um, cannot be complete or fully appreciated without uh, at least an introductory knowledge of equilibrium. So this material I've extracted from chapter 17, which is not, equilibrium is not uh, a separate topic in this introductory course, but it's so important that I, I drew some of the information out of chapter 17. And if you want to read it more, uh, if you want to dig into it a little deeper, uh, you'll find this information in chapter 17 of your textbook. Okay. What do we mean by equilibrium? Well, look at the word equal. So something's got to be equal. Uh, and in fact, uh, anytime two processes are occurring at exactly the same rate, they're balancing one another. Uh, we have potential for an equilibrium. Uh, in this case, in this example, evaporation and condensation. So evaporation is liquid becoming vapor and condensation is vapor becoming liquid. At some point in this closed vessel, the rate of evaporation equals the rate of condensation. And at that point we say the, uh, the system is at equilibrium. Um, what's um, important about this concept is that uh, equilibrium is a dynamic situation. It's a, it's a dynamic state of a system. In other words, um, it may look like nothing's happening on the surface. The macroscopic appearance is that things are stable and not moving. But underneath, on the microscopic level, the uh, activity is occurring at a furious rate. So what happens when you first put a liquid into a vessel and cap it? Well, you start to get some evaporation, right? But the evaporation is, in the beginning, the only process that occurs. So you're getting uh, liquid molecules becoming vapor molecules. But at some point, you start to get enough vapor molecules accumulating in the headspace that some of them start to return to the liquid phase. And um, then that continues uh, the evaporation and condensation uh, processes uh, continue to remain in flux until both processes are equal. And then we say we have an equilibrium. But those process processes continue um, rapidly 
evaporation, condensation, they're always occurring in a situation like this. <clears throat> and this is characteristic of any equilibrium. What we would call the forward reaction is balanced by the rate of the reverse reaction. <coughs> Excuse me. That's why we say it's dynamic. It's moving as opposed to static. Okay, um, this just reiterates what I said. Equilibrium is not static. It's, it's very dynamic, which means that any slight change that occurs to the environment, such as uh, a temperature change, decrease or increase, will influence the equilibrium. And we generally speak of, uh, when we talk about uh, chemical equilibria, we tend to focus on concentrations rather than absolute amounts. Okay, that brings us to the topic of Le Chatelier's principle. Le Chatelier was a, a Frenchman who recognized and proposed this principle that uh, once a system reaches equilibrium and the uh, we would write that as uh, this is a generic chemical equilibrium right the reactants and the products a plus b equals c plus d but in order to show the possibility for equilibrium we need a forward and a reverse reaction. So we recognize that once the forward and the reverse are now occurring at the same rate, then anything we do to disturb that system uh, will be responded to by the system itself. Uh, for instance, uh, once we've reached equilibrium, if we say add some of the C component, then what will happen? Well, you got that little extra C there, and if there's any D left, then they will react and drive the reaction back to the left until that balance is reestablished. So that, um, that equilibrium position shifts in order to reestablish equal rates in both directions. So here's a, a real example where we're reacting water and carbon monoxide and the products are hydrogen and carbon dioxide. And if we put this, if we establish this uh, reaction and the following equilibrium in a closed vessel, then what would happen <clears throat> if you add more water to the flask? <clears throat> you just inject some water vapor into the flask. What does that do? It tends to force the reaction to the right. Ah. I see you. There we go. Okay, let me see. Let me get both of us up there at the same time. There we go. So we're discussing um, equilibrium. <clears throat> the concept of equilibrium, I think, is essential to understanding acids and bases. And this material is covered in Chapter 17, which is not going to be part, which is not normally part of this course. <clears throat> but I saw the the need for understanding equilibrium is, is so great um, for also understanding acid-base chemistry that I slipped these few slides in here on the topic of equilibrium. And now we're talking about Le Chatelier's principle. Once the equilibrium is established where the forward rate and the reverse rate are equal, that's what equilibrium means, 
then what would happen if you did something to disturb the system? And in this uh, concept, check uh, number one, if we add a little extra water to this side, the reactants, what it's going to do is get a response from the system that will consume some of that water. In other words, the reaction will shift to the right. Uh, it won't consume all of that water. It will consume a large part of it until the forward and the reverse rate are reestablished as equal. So by the same token, what would happen if you add more product? Say we add more hydrogen. Well, now the reaction is unbalanced on the product side and it shifts back toward the reactants until equilibrium is reestablished. That is forward and reverse rates are established. Okay, uh, this chemical equilibrium can be quantified. In other words, if we have this reaction, and let me modify that just a little bit. And give it coefficients. The, um, this is called the law of mass action. And K is a constant. So as long as you don't change the temperature of the reaction conditions, then this K will remain constant. If you change the temperature, then it shifts. <clears throat> but um, how do you calculate the K? As long as you have a balanced equation, then the numerator contains the product of the concentration of the C component times the concentration of the D component, and each one raised to the power of its coefficient. Okay. So we would take this one here, raise it to that power. And notice we use square brackets. That's by convention. Square brackets in chemistry mean equilibrium concentration. So the equilibrium concentration, once the system has come to equilibrium, then the concentration of C to the C power is a component in the numerator. Do the same thing with the D, like that. And then the denominator has this form. Okay. Now, just as a, a, a side note, if we put parentheses here instead of square brackets, then that's accepted as meaning that the concentrations are not at equilibrium. For instance, if you're given a, uh, a situation where you're given concentrations of A and B and C and D, before the reaction starts, initial conditions, then those would be in parentheses. And then once the system reached equilibrium and you determine the concentrations of the components, then you would use square brackets. Okay. Uh, this law of mass action is written that way so that we can uh, deduce some generalities also, in, in, in addition to specifics, generalities about um, what type of reaction is it. Notice that if this term up here is very large and this term down here is very small, that means that the reaction reaches equilibrium when it's mostly product. But if this one is small and this one is large, that means the reaction reaches equilibrium uh, when it's mostly reactants. 
okay? So the size of K can give us an indication as to whether it favors products or favors reactants. Uh, okay. So here's an example. I, I've used this one quite often. This is the, uh, the uh, Haber-Bosch reaction where you take atmospheric nitrogen, react it with hydrogen, and you get ammonia. So once we balance the equation, and that's balanced, right? There's two nitrogen, two there. There's six hydrogens here and six hydrogens there. So once you've established that balanced equation, then you can write the equilibrium expression. So this expression, the product, there's only one of them, to the second power, divided by the product of nitrogen to the first power times hydrogen to the third power is constant at a given temperature. Okay, so it doesn't matter how much of the reactants and products you put together. As long as the temperature is the same, then they will eventually reach an equilibrium uh, which can be written in that expression is equal to the constant. So what that means is uh, for a given temperature, that K is always constant. It doesn't change. But if you start off with different amounts of reactants and products, then they may reach equilibrium at a different position. So this expression is constant, but it may be represented by high amounts of C and high amounts of A, high amounts of D and high amounts of B. Or it could be small amounts of C, small D, small A, small B still equal to K, but it's a different equilibrium position. That's an important distinction, uh, particularly where Le Chatelier's principle is, is involved. Because what happens if it's an equilibrium and you add some of this component, then it shifts back this way, but now you have a little bit more C than you did before, and you definitely have more A and B, but you will have less D because you added C and it consumed some of that D. So see that the actual concentrations have changed, but the K did not. Okay. So um, if we consider this reaction, so what is this? Remember that is the acetate polyatomic ion so we add a hydrogen to the front of it, make it an acid. In aqueous solution, that is acetic acid. Right, remember your nomenclature. Well, in solution, this molecule will partially dissociate. In other words, that hydrogen will leave and the acetate ion will be free and the uh, proton Right? A hydrogen ion, positively charged hydrogen ion, is basically a proton. Most of them, anyway. Uh, if it were deuterium or tritium, that would be a little different, but most of them are just protons. So that's why I refer to it as proton sometimes, rather than hydrogen ion. Um, but you get this uh, dissociation. And that reaction, at some point, reaches equilibrium. What's the expression? Well, you need this concentration times that concentration in the numerator, and they're all coefficients of one, so there's, there's, uh, they're all to the power of one. So you have hydrogen ion, acetate ion in the numerator, and acetic acid in the denominator. So where do we have that? Well, let's see. Looks like this one fits the bill right there. That would be the expression for the, the uh, K value for this uh, acid dissociation. Now that K obviously comes in lots of different flavors. 
depending on the reaction. Some subscripts of K are given to denote what type of reaction it's referencing. Uh, if it's just a plain K and, and you don't care where it came from, you may say K EQ for the equilibrium constant. If it's a K for this, which is an acid dissociation, that's designated by a K sub A for acid. And you can do the same thing for a base. We'll have to discuss what's the difference between an acid and a base, so I'll leave that for now. And then the units also make a difference. Most often, we express concentrations in molarity. Right? So if it says KEQ or KA, you can assume that the concentrations are in molarity, moles per liter. But sometimes if if all the components in your reaction mixture are gases, sometimes you can express the concentration in terms of partial pressure. Right? In that case, we would say Kp. All right. So in this previous example here, notice everything's a gas. So if we express it like this, we're saying molarity is the concentration. But we can also write it like this, right? Partial pressure of ammonia. To the, oh, excuse me, to the second power. Partial pressure of nitrogen to the first power. And partial pressure of hydrogen to the third power. Now, the problem with that is there are no brackets, right? So is this initial or is this equilibrium? Well, if you want to be uh, a stickler for details, you can put these in brackets. Like that. Then you know it's partial pressure at equilibrium. But since we're using different units of measure, this K is not the same as that K. They are related, but uh, converting one to the other is not, is not something that we're gonna deal with in this class. This is an introductory course. For my general chemistry students, we do the, the conversion. Okay. So there we have the correct expression for an acid dissociation. Now this will be common for any acid dissociation, right? You'll have this part of the molecule, this whole molecule will be in the denominator. Then you'll have one for the hydrogen ions and one for the, uh, the anion uh, that breaks apart from it. So this is a general form also for any acid dissociation. And we'll show you that one uh, as we progress. Okay, so what would be the value if we calculated the equilibrium constant for this one? If we say that uh, dinitrogen tetroxide is this concentration at equilibrium and nitrogen dioxide is this concentration at equilibrium, how would you write that? We would say in the numerator, we have the product 0 0.060 to the second power. And then the reactant in the numerator is 0 0.055. Okay. Simple. Then you just take your calculator and crunch the numbers. So we'll square this one, 0 0.06, 0 0.06 squared, and then we'll divide by 0 0.055. 6, let's see, 2 significant figures. 
6.5 times 10 to the minus 2. Okay? That is the equilibrium concentration uh, constant, which uh, in standard notation would be 0 0.065. Notice that I didn't put any units here. We don't use units for equilibrium constants simply because the sky's the limit, right? Since you've got different components, you can have any number here, any number here, multiplied times each other, and then any of those could be powers, then we can have who knows what units of measure out here. So what we have to do is be very careful about calculating our values and if you look at any reference manual for K values for a reaction there won't be any units except maybe to say that all equilibria uh, are calculated in units of molarity so every concentration is in molarity or it may be a list of uh, K values for partial pressure reactions, where you have only gases, uh, which this one would be a valid one. There's a gas there and a gas there, and that's it. So you could use partial pressures here also. Okay, uh, let me see. I'm gonna flip through my hard copy so it'll help me stay on track. Um, Let's see. Okay, I do want to make one comment about calculating these equilibrium constants. There are um, reactants and products that are not included in the calculation of a K. Um, and those would be anytime you have a solid, so you have something here that's a solid is not included. Or if you have something that's designated um, pure liquid, those are not included either. So for our purposes, the only two types of reactants or products that are included in the K calculation are either gases or solutions. In our case, most often aqueous solutions. But any kind of solution you can include in the calculation because they actually can be represented by some form of concentration. Solids, in, when they're reacting, they don't change concentration. I mean, they just are a lump of solid. If you take some off of it, you know, what's the change? Well, there is a change of volume, but it's not something that's easily calculated. So we just don't include them. And we don't include pure liquids either. Right? Because they're pure. They're 100% always until they're either gone or the reaction stops. Okay. Uh, so this, um, this next, this slide references what I mentioned earlier. When we, when we look at the expression for a K and the value that goes with it, we can determine qualitatively whether the reaction prefers to be mostly products or mostly reactants or whether it's somewhere in between. So if the K is, is much larger than one, that means what? Equilibrium is reached when you have mostly products. So the equilibrium lies to the right. Okay, now, uh, the use of the term right and left is, is valid only if you're referencing a balanced equation. If I say the reaction lies to the right and I don't have an equation that I'm referencing, then that means absolutely nothing. 
if you if you have the, a, a vision of a reaction in your mind and you say right and left, then it's still in your head. If you try to communicate that to someone else, they don't know what you're talking about because they don't know what reaction you're referencing. So if we were to say, um, just like that, A equals C. Then if we say the reaction moves to the right, then we know what we're talking about. It favors C as product. But if we write it the other way, and say the same thing, then we're saying something entirely different. Now the product used to be the reactant. Okay, so it's important to, whenever you say right and left, reference a balanced equation. Um, also, if the K is extremely large, like if it's uh, some coefficient times 10 to the third or 10 to the fourth or 10 to the eighth power, that reaction essentially goes to completion. And there's virtually, there might be a small amount of reactant left, but not much. And by the same token, if the uh, K is very small, like 10 to the minus third, 10 to the minus 10, then we're saying that the reaction basically doesn't go at all. It produces very little product. Okay, and the equilibrium position lies far to the left. All right. Um, now, like any equation, that equilibrium expression, if you know every term in that equation except for one, you can solve for it. So previously, we solved for the K by knowing what the equilibrium concentrations were. But say you already know the K, and you're given equilibrium concentrations for all the components except for one. You can solve for it and find out what that component is, concentration. So if the equilibrium lies to the right, the value of K should be large, uh, greater than one to some extent. Uh, if the equilibrium lies to the left, the K should be much smaller, very much smaller than one. Okay, so that's my uh, introduction to equilibrium. And I, th I think that's probably all we'll need to further our understanding of acids and bases. <clears throat> now we need to look at um, the actual definition of acids and bases. In uh, 1884, a Swedish chemist, actually he started out as a physicist, but he transitioned into chemistry. Uh, physical chemistry in particular, uh, named uh, Svant Arrhenius, S-V-A-N-T-E. He was Swedish. Uh, in fact, he was the first uh, Swedish scientist to receive the Nobel Prize. And that seems odd because uh, Alfred Nobel was Swedish and established the Nobel Prize. But uh, Arrhenius was the first uh, Swede to receive the Nobel Prize in 1903. Uh, anyway, in 1884, he proposed a definition for acids and bases um, based upon the concept that acids always produce uh, protons, hydrogen ions. So if that happens, then We know that's a generic acid, right? We know that that has to happen. In other words, the proton has to be part of the original molecule for that to happen. Bases, on the other hand, he said, produce hydroxyls from their structures. Like that. So that was Arrhenius' definition for acids and bases. 
And for the vast majority of acids and bases, that holds. That is true. You have a, a dissociable hydrogen here, at least one, sometimes two or three. And one of them comes off and leaves you with this anion. If it's a base, then this hydroxyl dissociates and uh, produces this free hydroxyl in solution. Uh, and this positive, this cation, is left behind. Now, we're going to restrict, in fact, Arrhenius did restrict his discussion of acids and bases to aqueous solutions. And uh, we're going to do that for this class. You can discuss acids and bases in terms of non-aqueous solutions, where the solvent is something other than water. But that's a little beyond this level, of course. So we're going to just stay with aqueous solutions and uh, keep our definitions confined. Okay, so that was that's a valid definition. Uh, the problem arose, and chemists knew it, they just didn't know how to deal with it, <clears throat> that in some cases you get basic solutions, but the molecule doesn't have a hydroxyl in it. So how does that happen? For instance, okay, if you put ammonia gas, you bubble ammonia through water, some of it dissolves in the water, and what it produces is this ammonia will take a proton from that water and become that ammonium, so what's left behind? If you take one of these hydrogens away, and it's the positive, it's a proton, it leaves a negative behind. And there's an oxygen and a hydrogen together. Right. And that's aqueous also. So, there you have your hydroxyl making your basic solution, but it it's nowhere to be found in that molecule. So this is not an Arrhenius base. Okay? So, um, uh, two persons, Bronsted and Lowry. Let's see, Bronsted, where's Bronsted from? Lowry's an Englishman. Bronsted, I think it was, uh, it was Danish. Uh, but they independently proposed a new definition for acids and bases. Okay. In 1923, uh, they both <laughs> independently proposed this thing. So we give them both credit. So the bronsted lauer definition focuses on protons only. It doesn't say anything about hydroxyls. Hydroxyls are there, and they are produced in a reaction. But as far as the definition of acids and bases go, we're only concerned with the proton transfer. Okay, so um, an acid is a proton donor. So this is an acid because it donates a proton. Now, we need to modify our equation because if you donate, it's got to go somewhere, right? It can't just split off and, and float around. So this one, um, if, this, if the acid is all there is in solution, Right. In pure water, acid, then there's nothing else for it to donate to except water. So it transfers that proton to water and produces this. Right. And these are all aqueous. Well, this is pure liquid. And this is aqueous. This is aqueous. So what's left over? Okay. So that's a Bronsted-Lowry acid. It donates a proton to the water molecule. 
and produces this hydronium ion. Okay? Now the base is uh, defined as a proton acceptor. All right, there's an example of hydrochloric acid doing what I just showed you. <clears throat> so, with the Bronsted Lowry definition, bases are proton acceptors. So now this is an acid, and water is a base because it accepts a proton. If we look at the previous reaction where we have ammonia in water, now that ammonia, that ammonia is a, a proton acceptor. So this is the base. Now water is the acid because it donates a proton and produces this plus this. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> okay, so there's, I put that one up there already. Uh, let me see. Definitions. Yep. Okay, we're coming to more definitions. So, um, the Bronsted-Lowry definition says, this is an acid, this is a base. Isn't that funny? Water's a base here, but it's an acid there. <clears throat> That's known as the amphoteric nature of water. It can either be an acid or base, depending on the environment. Well, what are these called? Well, now, this one could donate a proton. It's got an extra proton, an extra hydrogen that it could donate. So this is an acid. If the reaction goes backwards, right? We say the reactions can go both ways. So going this way, that's the acid base. But going this way, that would be the acid donating a proton to that base. Okay. The problem is, if you talk about this reaction and say acid base, acid base, which one's which? Right. So we say <coughs> this is the reactant side, so these get dibs on the name acid and base. The product side has to use modification. This is the conjugate acid of that base. That base makes this conjugate acid, and that acid makes this conjugate base. Okay? We could say the same thing here. That's a base. What's the conjugate acid? It's this one right here. And this acid makes a conjugate base. Okay, now we know what we're talking about. The conjugate acids and bases are always products. <clears throat> All right. The defining the defining nature of acid versus conjugate base is that you only lose one proton in the process <clears throat> and you keep the core of the molecule intact. So there's the A, it's still A as a charge now, but it only lost one proton. If you write a reaction where more than one proton is lost, say you have two here, and you end up over there, that's not a conjugate base. It's only conjugate if it loses one proton only.
<clears throat> okay. So here's the artist uh, idea of what happens when hydrochloric acid reacts with water. This one proton, which is, notice that the chloride is more electronegative than the hydrogen. In other words, it draws electric electron density towards itself. And what that makes, the hydrogen is now electron deficient. It has a slight positive charge. The chloride has a slight negative charge. So it makes it much easier for this slight positive charge to be attracted to these lone pair electrons. So this hydrogen associates itself with this water molecule. It actually bonds and leaves the negative, the complete negative charge behind with the chlorine. So this one positive goes over here, bonds, and carries its positive charge with it. Okay, I mentioned that earlier. So let's see if we can recognize conjugate acid-base pairs. All right, so let me make some room up here. Okay, now we do, there we go. All right, so we've got um, a, B, C, and D, correct? What about this one? Is that a conjugate acid base pair? <laughs> I don't think so. That's a, a complete acid and that's a complete acid. Right? This is hydrochloric acid. This is nitric acid. So that's not a conjugate acid base pair. How about the next one? This one. And that one. Is that a conjugate acid base pair? Well, if this is the acid, the donor of the proton, what do you get when one of those protons is lost? What's left over? Two hydrogens, one oxygen, and the positive charge goes there. So that's not a conjugate. This is the acid, that's the conjugate base. That's not the conjugate base of that acid, right? So that one's not it either. Let's move this down. Okay, how about C, H2SO4. And SO4 two minus. All right, that part right there is this part, right? The sulfate ion polyatomic ion. But what did you have to do to go from here to here? Now, that may be a valid uh, equation, but it's not a conjugate acid-base pair reaction. This one loses one proton only so it would need to be like this. Like that. Like that. That is the conjugate base of that acid. This is not the conjugate base. What if we lose another proton from this one? Which you can do. Right? If we lose another proton there, and that's just this part, what do you have left over? There you go. Now this, if this is the acid, right, we do one dissociation, then we take this one and do another one. This now becomes the acid for this reaction. And that is the conjugate base of this acid, not that acid. Okay, see what I mean? And the last one, H, C, N, and C, N minus. That is a conjugate acid-base pair. 
you've lost one proton to produce this conjugate base. Okay? There you go. All right. Let's see. Make sure we're centered again. Okay, next slide. What do we mean by Uh, right. What do we mean by strong versus weak acid? In chemical terms, um, what you normally think of as strong acid is not the same as the way we think of it in chemistry. In chemistry, a strong acid is an acid that completely dissociates in aqueous solution. Right? So this one, uh, reacting with water, produces this hydronium ion plus this conjugate base of the acid. And the reaction is almost completely to the right. In other words, uh, all of these protons are now available in solution to express their acidity. That's a strong acid when you get complete dissociation. As opposed to a weak acid in which most of the acid is still intact in solution and only produces a very small amount of the uh, conjugate acid and the conjugate base. That's a weak acid. Now, what we normally think of as strong acid is something that will attack your skin or even eat metal. Right? And even a weak acid can do that. It just depends on how concentrated it is. If a weak acid is very dilute, in other words, not much of it in solution to start with, then you're not going to get much hydronium ion produced and the acid effect is very low. So that's why uh, for, for our foods, like um, uh, I love uh, kale or collard greens or mustard greens, you always put a little vinegar on them, right? Well, the vinegar is only 5%. five percent acetic acid right it's a weak acid so at that concentration it's not going to damage the mucous membranes of your uh, mouth or your throat uh, it just gives you the acid flavor the desirable effect <laughs> uh, along with the taste of your greens but if you're working in a laboratory like I used to and you buy acetic acid in a uh, two and a half gallon jug, then you can buy it as 100 percent. That's known as glacial. And I guarantee if you spill some of that on your skin, it will start eating through your skin immediately. Right? So that's normally what we think of as strong acid. It's just concentrated. But in chemical terms, this is a weak acid. It may be corrosive, but it's still a weak acid. Okay? Now, you could get that same effect with um, nitric acid. If it's only, oh, say 0 0.5 molar, nitric acid would be as dangerous as glacial acetic acid. 
Yeah, maybe not. Maybe you need a little bit more concentration, but they're still corrosive, both of them. It's just that this is a strong acid because it dissociates. This is a weak acid because it doesn't dissociate much. Okay. I hope I made that uh, distinction clear. <clears throat> and this is the artist's idea of what a strong acid and a weak acid are. Over here, the acid dissociates completely. Over here, weak acid dissociates very little. So, what's the acid in your stomach? Uh, we talk about, I got a sour stomach, or uh, we talk about stomach acid as being corrosive. It's hydrochloric acid in your stomach. But it's at a low concentration. And, and um, it can be in the neighborhood of, um, oh, a tenth to maybe 0 0.05 molar, 0.05 to 0.1 molar, um, hydrochloric acid in your stomach, which is, it's enough to start digesting your food, but not enough to eat a hole in your stomach, because your stomach has protective mechanisms most of the time. Uh, if those protective mechanisms break down, then yeah, that acid will eat a hole in your stomach, which is called an ulcer. Okay. Um, okay, here's another topic. Remember that when we produce a, um, well, let's use hydrochloric acid. Strong acid plus water yields um, hydronium plus chloride. Okay. We know that hydrochloric acid is a strong acid. That means it wants to completely dissociate. Okay? Which it does. It produces mostly that and that. So we have a great big, big era here to designate like that. So what does that mean about the reverse reaction? Well, it means that that chloride doesn't want a proton. It just got rid of a proton. It doesn't want it back. So what is that in chemical terms? That strong acid produces a weak conjugate base. Okay? And that's characteristic. If the acid is strong, then the conjugate base is weak. And it stands to reason. If it's strong, it dissociates completely. That's what it wants to do. So the conjugate base is weak because it doesn't want to go back where it came from. We can say the same thing about weak acids. So if we have um, acetic acid plus water produces hydronium plus acetate ion, okay? Now, if this is the weak acid, it does not prefer to dissociate. Most of it is just like that. Then what does that say about the conjugate base? This is a strong conjugate base. Okay? So, if you put acetate ion in water uh, without the acid, in other words, you put a compound in the water that makes the acetate ion, what's it going to do? It's going to hunt out water molecules. Not these. Plain water molecules. This becomes, this is the base. The water molecule becomes the Bronsted-Lowry acid, donates a proton, because now this is a strong base. It wants a proton. Bad. It wants to be like this. So when it takes that proton away from water, what's left over? Hydroxyls. Right? That means 
if you put acetate ion in solution, say as um, sodium acetate, as a, a good choice, it's completely soluble, then that acetate ion attacks a water molecule, takes its proton, and leaves a hydroxyl behind. So now you have a basic solution, even though you added this part of a weak acid. Okay. Now, let's see, is there anything more to this thing? Okay, that's, that was just what I said. Strong acids make weak conjugate bases and vice versa. Weak acids make strong conjugate bases. So for, um, we can describe the strength of an acid in terms of dissociation, right? The forward reaction predominates for a strong acid because it dissociates. It donates its protons freely and almost 100%. Weak acid is the other way around. A weak acid does not donate protons. It prefers to stay as it is. And the few protons that it does donate um, go into solution, of course. And if this acid and this acid are at the same nominal concentration when you first put them in solution, this one produces almost the entire, well, for practical purposes, this concentration is the same as the acid that you put in with a strong acid. So if you know the concentration of the strong acid that you put in, you also know the concentration of protons. Whereas with a weak acid, when you put a certain concentration in, like let's just make it easy, one molar, one molar HA, uh, you might get uh, 10 to the minus three molar. Now let's be consistent with acetic acid, it would be uh, 10 to the minus five molar of Proton, uh, yeah, protons, hydronium atoms, ions. Okay. But the base is just the opposite. For the strong acid, the conjugate base is going to be very weak, which by definition means it doesn't want protons. A weak base does not serve as a very good base. It's a poor base. Whereas with a weak acid, the base that it produces, the conjugate base, is a very strong base. Okay, <clears throat> there are several strong acids that we can identify. Sulfuric is one. Hydrochloric, we talked about. Nitric is a good one. Perchloric is an ex excellent strong acid. <clears throat> but it's tricky to use. Um, nitric can be, and sulfuric can be also a problem uh, in association with organic matter. But perchloric acid is, is the king, right? <laughs> you react perchloric acid with, uh, with organic matter and it produces a lot of heat. It's very exothermic. And if you have large amounts of readily available organic matter and you put perchloric acid with it, um, don't heat it up without protection because it could explode. In fact, I tell my students this. Um, if you want some excitement, uh, take a big beaker of perchloric acid, which would be in the neighborhood of 70% uh, by weight, uh, perchloric acid in solution. And then you take a big chunk of butter, say about uh, maybe two tablespoons would be enough and you drop it in that beaker. It's okay now because it's cold. But you put it on your hot plate and you crank it up to high under the hood and you pull the sash down. Of course, the hood is, is uh, evacuating. And then you, uh, speaking of evacuating, you evacuate the building because once it gets hot enough, that mixture will blow and take half the building with it. Okay, so um, 
Actually, that's not a consequence of the acidity of perchloric acid. The acidity of perchloric acid simply produces hydrogen ions and the conjugate base, the chlorate ion, the perchlorate ion. The uh, explosive nature of perchloric acid in contact with organic matter is due to the uh, perchlorate ion. It's a strong oxidizing agent. Right. So I was, I was introducing another topic. We're supposed to stick with acids right now, so I better get back to that talk. Okay. So, um, let's see, do I mention, I'm going to see if I talk about it for, if I could talk about it here or later. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about it here. Uh, notice that all of these acids except for one has only one proton. So when we say strong acid hydrochloric, uh, yeah, it gives up one proton, makes a chloride ion as a conjugate base. Uh, nitric acid dissociates with one proton and the nitrate ion as its conjugate base. Perchlorate makes one proton and the perchlorate ion. Well, sulfuric acid dissociates one proton and makes the hydrogen sulfate ion, HSO4 minus. That's the strong acid part of sulfuric acid. So let me illustrate. H2SO4 plus water yields uh, hydronium plus HSO4 minus. That's the strong acid reaction. Now, if you try to remove another proton from this one, It's much more difficult to remove that second proton. Why? Primarily because you're trying to remove a positive charge from a negative, and they're attracting one another. So the, the opposition force to transferring that proton to water is much stronger. So this is a weaker acid than that one. In fact, um, this may even be classified as a weak acid, this one right here. All right, um, that's enough said about that. Let's go to the next topic. All right, nomenclature. Uh, remember, this is just a uh, recall. When we name an acid, if it's got oxygen in it, you don't say hydro, correct? So with HCl, we say hydrochloric. The chloride ion becomes chloric. But with oxygen in the molecule, you look for the, the owner of the oxygen, which is nitrate, and eights become X, but we don't say hydro. So it's nitric acid. Okay? Uh, sulfate's the same way. Sulfate becomes sulfuric. Uh, Perchlorate becomes perchloric acid. And HF right, has no oxygen, so sulf, uh, fluoride becomes hydrofluoric acid. Okay, uh, these acids that have oxygen in them. They're known as oxyacids. And um, you may be wondering why we need to bother with them. Well, the strength of the acid, in other words, how, how willing is it to give up a proton, increases with the number of oxygens. So if we look at a, a homologous series, they call them. Remember when we were trying to... Um, identify polyatomic ions, we could group them. And one of the groups I showed you was the 
the uh, halogen chlorine. So if you start with that one, the chlorate ion, then you could make, um, take one away. This is um, chlorate. Take one away, you get chlorite. Take another one away, you get hypo chloride. And then if you add one, you get that infamous perchlorate. Okay. All right. So if we, if we um, add a proton to that, then we get the acid. The proton is positive, the ion was negative, so they cancel, and now we have a neutral molecule. But now we need to name them. Right? So this is, since they have oxygen, we don't say hydro, this would be perchlor, perchloric acid. This would be chloric acid. This would be ites become uses. This is chlorus acid. And this is hypochlorous acid. Okay. Now notice the only difference in here is the number of oxygens. So as we increase the number of oxygens, the the strength of the acid increases. Okay? Add more oxygens, you get a stronger acid. So what does that mean as far as the bronsted lowry nature is concerned? the proton donor, right? This is less likely to donate a proton than that one. So what does that mean? Remember that diagram we had with the slight negative and slight positive? Right. The positive nature of this increases with more oxygens and the negative nature here increases with more oxygen. That's because um, oxygen is more electronegative than either, well, oxygen adds to the electronegativity of chlorine, right? They're both electronegative atoms. But if you add more oxygens, then you draw more electron density away from the proton. So this nature increases and that one increases which makes it easier to remove the proton, right? You weaken the bond between this polyatomic and that proton as you increase the number of oxygens. So that's why the strength of the acid increases with the number of oxygens, okay? These are, these are oxy acids, and they will have a polyatomic ion with an oxygen in them. Then there are, are there other acids that are not formed the same way. And I'll show you what I mean by that in just a second. These are called organic acids. So I need to define what that means. Organic acids have any organic compound is based upon a carbon structure. It's got to have carbon and it's got to have hydrogen in it to be organic. That's by definition. So uh, carbon dioxide is not organic. But 
methane is organic. Well, um, what if we attach this to another carbon, right? This had four hydrogens around it like that. This one only has three hydrogens because one of those positions is taken up by another carbon. Okay. But what instead, if that carbon has hydrogens around it, what if it has oxygens? And in fact, one of those oxygens has a hydrogen attached to it. And that one is a double bonded oxygen. In that case, we have a carboxylic acid. And all the carboxylic acids have this structure in common. And there's your ox, their hydrogen. Right. That hydrogen is the acidic one. Now, what molecule is that? Well, let's see, we have two carbons. We have one, two, three. We have three hydrogens here. And we'll put this acid hydrogen out in front. That's how we do it. We put the, the acidic hydrogen goes out in front. These hydrogens are not acidic. They can't break away from that carbon. And then we have two oxygens. What does that look like? That looks like acetic acid, doesn't it? Okay. So when you form the acetate ion, that's the hydrogen that pops off. Now, there are other types of organic acids. This is a very common one, but organic compounds also have other acid groups. They're just weaker than this one. And we'll, we'll stop at that. Um, everybody's heard of lactic acid? <clears throat> If you go exercise and you work muscles that have gotten lazy, probably within a day, they'll start getting sore. That's because there's a buildup of lactic acid in the muscle tissue. And it stimulates your pain receptors. It hurts until your body has a chance to remove the lactic acid. Well, the lactic acid is a metabolic product of... Um, anaerobic reactions, oxidations, as, a first, as opposed to aerobic, right? Your muscles are not, they're, they're, they're um, lazy, and they don't have the ability to transmit a lot of oxygen to the muscles so that you can uh, work them uh, so that the, uh, the compounds in there are completely consumed. They produce these intermediate products. Let's just put it that way. Lactic acid is one of them. Formic acid, right? There's that, when you see COOH on the end of a molecule, that's that carboxylic acid group. Well, this one has a carboxylic acid group, and the only thing attached to it is hydrogen. So that line right there leads to a hydrogen for this one, all right? So what is formic acid? Well, it is the simplest carboxylic acid. It's organic, but it's the simplest one. And it gets its name. Formic gets its name. It's derived from the same root word for ant. You know, the little six-legged things that crawl around and sometimes bite. That's why it's called formic acid. Because formic acid is one of the components in an ant, ant bite, especially fire ants. If you've ever encountered fire ants, you will never forget. <sighs> um, <coughs> when they bite, they inject a cocktail of poisons, which includes formic acid and some other compounds, and they burn bad. They destroy tissue. In fact, everywhere you have a fire ant bite, it'll produce a little white pimple. That's necrosis. 
of those cells that have been destroyed by that ant. Well, fire ants have a nasty habit. If you've ever encountered them, um, I used to work in Louisiana and fire ants were everywhere. In fact, the fire ant males would be like two, three feet high, some of them, huge. You don't want to disturb them because they're very, very belligerent. Um, so much so that when I was working there, uh, we'd get graduate students coming and going. And we'd always warn them, when we go to the field, watch out for those mounds. You know, don't step on them. Don't get near them. And invariably, <laughs> on our first visit in the summer, um, we'd turn around and there would be the graduate student coming out of his pants and running across the field. <laughs> he disturbed a fire ant mound. <clears throat> so um, they had to learn the hard way. Okay, I personally think that fire ants, uh, they have, um, they, they work in a group, they're like a little army, and they crawl up your pants while you're not watching, and then one of them has a bugle, and when he blows that bugle, they all bite at once. <clears throat> well, back to the topic here. That's formic acid. Uric acid is a compound that's produced in the human body. Uh, it's also in very small amounts. You don't want a lot of uric acid in your body because it tends to accumulate in your joints. And when it does, then you get a condition called gout. It can also form stones in your kidney. Right? Not the... Um, uh, two types of stones can form in your kidneys. Uh, the ones that are carbonate rich, the calcium stones, and then the uric acid, which are often called soft stones, can form. Uh, uric acid is a solid, right, and, and it's uh, uh, insoluble in water, or very slightly soluble. Um, but it's, it's derived from nitrogen compounds. Okay, uh, proteins and nucleic acids, and you may not know what those are, but they're components of your body and your cells. Uh, when, when they break down, when they're damaged or they need to be recycled, your body tears them apart. And one of the compounds that it produces is ammonia. Well, ammonia is very toxic. So our bodies usually convert ammonia into urea. Uh, urea and your kidneys excrete that and it collects in your bladder until you relieve yourself and it eliminates that nitrogen waste um, it's less toxic but it requires water All right, so you have to eliminate water also well that's okay for mammals right because we're not weight restricted uh, based upon uh, that concept but for birds and some amphibians, uh, their preferred method of eliminating nitrogen waste is not urea, but uric acid. Because uric acid is a solid, they can eliminate it without losing water, right? So they don't dehydrate themselves. Plus, they don't have to carry a lot of extra water or drink a lot to make up the difference that uh, urea would require. So when you see bird poop, uh, hopefully on the ground, <laughs> less hopefully on your car, and definitely not on yourself. When you look at bird poop, it has some dark component, which is normally what we consider feces, and then it has white component. That's the uric acid. That's their nitrogen waste. They combine them both and eliminate at the same time. Okay. And also notice that this way you've got two nitrogens per molecule. With uric acid, you've got four nitrogens. 
So it's much more efficient at eliminating nitrogen from uh, waste from your body. If we could do it, but our bodies are not set up for that. If you produce excess uric acid, it's likely to cause disease rather than uh, be a, a benefit. Citric acid is another acid, organic acid. And it's named citric because it's a, a major component in citric fruit, cit, citrate fruits like oranges and lemons and limes. That's where you get the most of the sour flavor. You also have vitamin C in there, which is another type of acid called ascorbic acid. But citric acid um, is this appears to be a complex molecule. Uh, but notice, and when we write organic compounds, whenever you see lines meeting here, like this joint right there, that is a carbon atom. There's a carbon there. There's a carbon there. There's a carbon there. There's a carbon there. And there's a carbon there. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons in this molecule. Notice also that we don't always write the hydrogens in there either. This carbon has two hydrogens. It has these two bonds plus two hydrogens. This one has no hydrogens. That one's okay. This one, that's okay. This one has another two hydrogens. Right? But um, notice this group here is a carboxylic acid. This one's a carboxylic acid. This one's a carboxylic acid. So this molecule has three protons that can be dissociated as acid. Okay. So now let's talk about uh, Okay, we're going to try to use what we've learned so far to answer a question. So consider a one molar solution of HCl, one mole of HCl per liter. And suppose we're given these three molecules, H2O, A minus, and Cl minus. Uh, in that solution with it. Which one of these is the strongest and which one is the weakest? And put them in order as a base. So a base would be a proton acceptor. All right, so we've got water. We've got A minus aqueous. We need to know something about that A minus. It's derived from a weak acid. So this is from a weak acid. Okay? And then we have this one. Okay, let's put them in order. Which one is the weakest base? The weakest base is the conjugate base derived from a strong acid, which would be chloride. Chloride is derived from HCl, the strong acid, so this would be the weakest. So strongest to weakest would be chloride is out here, and we do that to mean it's the weakest. What's the strongest? The strongest is the one derived from the weak acid, which would be A minus. And water is in the middle. Okay, here's the logic that I followed. I just gave it to you. But there it is in, in uh, black and purple. Okay, there you go. All right, so here's another one. Takes a little bit more effort. Uh, let's see. 
Okay. So now we're given a problem where we have acetic acid and HCN. What's that? Cyanide. No oxygen, so we say hydro. I becomes ick. Hydrocyanic acid. They're both weak. But acetic acid is stronger than hydrocyanic. Okay? So if acetic acid is stronger than HCN, eh, like that, which one, let's see, there's more to that one, excuse me. Which one of these, before we answer the question, let's say, which one of these is the, produces the stronger base? So this would produce conjugate base like that. This would produce a conjugate base like that. Right? So now, which one is the stronger base? It's just the opposite. That's the stronger base because this is the weaker acid. Now let's look at our list. Uh, water, so we've got to, we put, put these in order of weakest to strongest. Water, chloride, cyanide, and C2H3. Acetate. Okay, it, it helps to lock down the ends. So which would be the strongest base of all of these. That one right there, the cyanide. Okay, which would be the weakest, the chloride. Okay. Now we need to find out where does the water go and where does the acetic acid go? Well, as it turns out, uh, the acetate ion is a much stronger base than the water molecule. One second, let me think about that a second. Um, no. Acetate is a stronger is a stronger acid than water, so that makes uh, acetic acid is a stronger acid than water. So the acetate ion would be a weaker base than water. I think it should be like this. Now let's see what the what the slide says. Well, let's see. Oh, it is going to answer the question. All right, so I got it wrong. It's the other way around. But the next slide is going to explain. Okay, so let's see the explanation. <clears throat> All right, so this is a reminder. Acid-base reaction produces a conjugate acid, conjugate base. Notice that water water has a K value of its own. So how does that work? All right, we're going to slide this one in as we're as we're solving this problem, we're going to slide this discussion in. So KW is a special equilibrium constant assigned only to water. So what does that mean? Well, that means uh, water K 
can react with itself. Actually, it's not reacting with itself. This water molecule in that solution is reacting with another water molecule. And it's doing this. It's producing hydronium ions plus hydroxyls. Okay, and these are aqueous, of course. There we go. Now, how do we write that expression? Remember that liquids don't count. They're not part of the expression. So this equilibrium expression doesn't have a denominator, right? Because both of those are liquids. So it's just this one times this one. Like that. And that value is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 14. Okay. How did we get that? Well, we multiplied this one times that one. Where did those things come from? Right. They came from this side. So if you got this one, it's got to be equal to that one. There's no other possibility, right? Because one came from one and one came from the other, and they're one to one. So if you got a certain amount of this one and a certain amount of that one, they have to be equal. Well, how do you get equal to that? Ten to the minus seven for each one of them, multiplied together gives you ten to the minus fourteen. All right? When you multiply powers together, you add them. So minus seven and minus seven together makes minus fourteen. So pure water makes ten to the minus seven uh, hydronium ions and ten to the minus seven hydroxyl ions. Molar in solution. Okay. So that explains where uh, this is also called a neutral solution. It's got that concentration for, and sometimes this is written as hydrogen ions, which means the same thing. Okay. Uh, let's see. Why would I say X there? X is the expression for the equilibrium concentration of X. Okay. Well, oh, that's all right. We mentioned that earlier. That's what the square brackets stand for, for equilibrium concentration. So, it doesn't explain. Okay. So what this is saying is, this is a stronger base than that. So how would we know that's a stronger base? Well, if we knew what the values were for their Ks, right? I think this K is uh, about 10 to the minus 10. This K is about 10 to the minus well, that's the K for the acid, excuse me. K for the acid, K for the acid is about 10 to the minus 7, I believe. So this one, K, is 10 to the minus 14. And that one doesn't have a K. So I'm, I'm inclined to think that maybe water... If this is a weaker acid, it should be a, this is an acid concentrate uh, constant making a stronger base. So this hydroxyl should be a strong, oh, okay. If we're talking about um, this one accepting a proton, it's not particularly interested in accepting a proton because of that value. So that makes it a weaker base. Okay. 
But this K to the minus 7 acid means that in this one, minus 10 acid, then this conjugate base is very strong, and this one is a little weaker. Okay, so that makes sense. Makes sense to me. If this had been hydroxyl, right, this is a weaker acid than either of those. So the hydroxyl would be way out here. That would have been, if we had been given hydroxyl, it would go way out there. It's a very, very strong base. But this is not a strong base. Okay? All right. I probably need to beef up that discussion in the in the slides. That's a future project. All right. So let's see, what do we got next? Okay, <clears throat> I mentioned this earlier. Water is amphoteric. Ampho is the Greek prefix that means both. <coughs> so it can be both an acid or a base, depending on the environment. When it's just uh, water, pure water, then one molecule becomes the acid, and then another one, its neighbor, becomes the base. And this expression is like the one I wrote before, only now we're using proton here instead of hydronium. But it's the same uh, value for these. Uh, if you have a hydronium concentration, it's the same as we would represent as a proton concentration. Okay. One thing to remember is whenever you have an acid-base reaction or acids and bases in your aqueous solution, they have their K values, but water still has its K. It always has this K. No matter what else is going on, this K always operates, no matter what's in solution. <clears throat> Whether it's an acid, a base, or, or not, it could be a salt going into solution, whatever. Uh, this value is constant no matter what else is happening. So what are the possible situations? Well, we, we've described the, the uh, neutral pure water situation where hydrogen ions are equal to hydroxyl ions. That's a neutral solution. If you have more hydrogen ions than you do hydroxyls, that's an acidic solution. And you may have guessed if you have more hydroxyls than hydrogen ions, that's a basic solution. Right? That's definition. But in each case, this constant and this expression are always equal to 10 to the minus 14. Whether it's neutral, acidic, or basic, doesn't matter. This expression still works. So that's good. Because now, if you know what the hydrogen ion concentration is, say it exceeds the hydroxyl then you plug it in here and solve for hydroxyl and you can find out what the hydroxyl concentration is. Okay. Um, all right. So let's see if, if we really understand what was just said. Which blow is correct for an acidic solution? So if the solution is acidic, what do we know? Hydrogen ions are less than 10 to the minus 7? Right. Well, I erased it. 
But if it's neutral, both hydrogen and hydroxyls are 10 to the minus 7. That's where the 10 to the minus 14 comes from. So if hydrogen is less than 10 to the minus 7, what does that mean? That doesn't mean acidic. That means basic. Acidic is hydrogen ions greater than 10 to the minus 7. How about hydroxyls? If hydroxyls are greater than 10 to the minus 7, that's a basic solution. And if the balance is toward hydroxyls, that's also basic. So the only acidic solution in here is B. Okay. Uh, let's see. All right. So let's do a calculation. Say we have an aqueous solution in which the hydroxyl concentration is given as 2 times 10 to the minus 10. Let's say 2.0 times 10 to the minus 10 molar. What is the hydrogen ion concentration? Well, remember the Kw? It's equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 14, and it's always equal to hydrogen ions times hydroxyls, which would be 2.0 times 10 to the minus 10. Okay, so now we have an equation in one unknown we can solve for it. So the hydroxyl, uh, excuse me, the hydrogen ion concentration now is this one divided by this one okay now oh excuse me made boo boo there we go now how do we solve that well you can plug those numbers into your calculator, but suppose you don't have a calculator. How would you solve it? You would use your math skills. This can be subdivided into that one and this one. So that's the same as 1.0 divided by 2.0 times 10 to the minus 14 divided by 10 to the minus 10. Okay, so what's this one? That's 0 0.5, isn't it? 0 0.5. Times what? Well, um, a power of 10, if the, if the base is the same, then you focus on the powers. So ten, minus 14 minus a minus 10 because it's in the denominator. So that means this is minus 4, is it not? Right, change the sign. 10 plus minus 14 is minus 4. So let's, let's make this one kosher scientific notation. So move the decimal place to the right one, and we store that in this value. 5 times, actually this should be big. 5 times 10 to the minus 5 molar. Okay, there you have 10 to the minus 5 molar. So what does it need to be to be acidic? It's got to be greater than 10 to the minus 7. Right? Is 10 to the minus 5 greater than 10 to the minus 7? Yeah, two orders of magnitude higher. So C, well, here's our calculation. C is, uh, is the value for hydrogen ions, and it's acidic. Okay. Now, uh, there was a, uh, a Danish scientist. Who was tired of writing concentrations. 
in these big numbers in scientific notation. Even though it's a reduction, scientific notation is an abbreviation, so to speak, he wanted something even simpler. He was working with living systems, and he wanted a way to express the hydrogen ion concentration in uh, a very small, compact number. So he used a log transformation. Sorensen is his name. He took the log of the hydrogen ion concentration, which would be what? Well, let's take an example. Say you have uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 7. All right. So what's the log of that? Well, remember logs. Is common log is base 10. This value is the power of 10 that equals that number. Right? So since it's 10 to the minus 7, then the power of 10 would be minus 7. Right? So the log of that number is minus 7. But he didn't like negative numbers either. He wanted positive numbers. So he said, okay, there you go. There you go. So this transformation he called pH, small p, capital H, is an expression of acidity, or basicity, as the case may be. This is neutral. This is pH 7. That's neutral, and we know it's neutral because we started with that value. So what is... Um, what would be acidic? Well, suppose we had 10 to the minus 6 here. That would be 6 pH. So the concentration of hydrogen ions is increasing, and the pH number is decreasing. So anything smaller than 7 is acidic. Anything larger than 7 is basic. All right. Okay, so how do we deal with significant figures? That might be important. Well, the log transformation and the significant figure rules transferred to logs such that the number of decimal places in the log is equal to the number of significant figures. So if we have two decimals, uh, actually, we have um, uh, two significant figures here. Then we need uh, two decimal places. So this should be 7.00 pH to preserve the significant figures. And if you work backwards, if you take, if you calculate this from that, I'll show you how to do that in a second. Then you take this number of decimals is the number of significant figures in your coefficient. Okay. So this discusses the pH range, just like I said earlier. The higher the pH, the more basic. Lower the pH, pH the more acidic. Now what's a useful range? Well, this is just a mathematical equation. You can get negative pHs, right? All you need is, for instance, if you have 10 to the first power hydrogen ions, right? Then 10 to the first power is 1 times a negative. So you can get negative pHs. But the useful range, particularly for living systems that we're interested in, uh, would be uh, between 0 and about 14. But even more useful than that is around 1 up to maybe 12 and a half or so would be a reasonable expression of pH. Okay, there's blood, right? Blood is uh, 7. The normal pH for blood is between 7.35 and 7.45, I believe. 7.35, 7.45. 
my if my memory serves me. Okay, so let's calculate the pH of these guys. So A is 1 times 10 to the minus 14. So to calculate the, and that's hydrogen ion concentration. Okay. So what would the pH be? It's a simple log transformation. Negative log of 10 to the minus 14. We don't need to include 1, right, because that implies 1 there. So that would be equal to 14, negative 14. The negative of that is 14. So that's 14 pH. Oh, excuse me, 4. What am I thinking? There we go. <laughs> All right. How about what's the pH of this one? 0 0.04 molar hydroxyl. Okay. Uh, excuse me. Pick things up here. So B is based upon 0 0.04 molar hydroxyl ions. Okay. Well, how are we going to calculate pH from that? We don't have hydrogen ions. But we do have the KW is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 14 equals hydrogen ions times hydroxyls. So what's the hydrogen ion concentration? Well, let's see. We take this one and divide it by that one. So I get 2.5 times 10 to the minus 13. And the negative log of 2.5 times 10 to the minus 13 is equal to what? Well, we just take the log of that and then change the sign. Let's see. We've got two significant figures here. So our pH is 12.60. All right. There you go. That seems like a lot of trouble, doesn't it? Well, let's see. Let me keep up with my hard copy here. All right, before we go to the next problem, I want to explain something. Notice. KW equals hydrogen ions times hydroxyl, correct? What if? We take the negative log of that entire equation. Well, this is also equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 15. Let's take the negative log of that entire equation. What's wrong with that? It's mathematically permissible. We just take the negative log of this, the negative log of that, and that product and use our correct formulas and rules, take the negative log of that and see what we get. 
So we need to invent a new word. So the negative log of this, in, a, in, a, in line with Sorensen's notation, would be P K W, right? P H P uh, P H P K W. Now, how about the negative log of this one? That's P H, and this is P O H. But remember, when you take the log of a product, like. Um, the log of a product of two numbers is the same as the adding them together. So once we finish the transformation, we actually add this one to this one instead of multiply. That's the way logs work. And then what's the negative log of that? 14. So the pH plus the POH is equal to the PKW, which is 14. All right, now let's go to the next slide. The pH of a solution is 5.85. What's the hydrogen ion concentration for this solution? Well, we're gonna come back to this, so I'm gonna leave it up there. But we're gonna, we're gonna solve this one first. If the pH is equal to the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration, and that value is equal to 5.85. Okay. What does the log mean? Let's see. Am I still on? Yeah. Log of uh, y or x to the y base. Actually, to the 10 base. Excuse me. 10 base equals y. So what does that mean? That means 10 to the y power equals x. So if we want to know what this is, the x value, we take this as the power of 10. But that's negative, right? You can't do that yet. So you got to put the negative over here first. So the log of this equals negative 5.85. Now we can do 10 to the minus 5.85 equals what? Two significant figures, 1.4 times 10 to the minus 6. molar. Okay. This is also called the anti-log. So we take the anti-log of the negative 5.85. But on your calculator, the anti-log is 10 to the power equals the answer. Okay. So there we go. And there we go. And there we go. Actually, I got too many Two decimals means only two significant figures, so 1.41 is wrong. should be 1.4. Two significant figures because there are two decimal places. Okay. Um, oh, and here's the, this system right here worked out on this slide. So I, I kind of stole my own thunder. pH plus POH equals PKW, which is equal to 14. So, um, what if we know that the hydrogen ion concentration is 1 times 10 to the minus 4, and we want to know the POH for the following? All right. So, 1 times 10 to the minus 4 hydrogen ion concentration uh, molar 
the pH equals four, correct? So what's the pOH? The pOH is 14 minus four equals 10. Well, there we go. All right. <clears throat> so that was A. What about the next one? Zero point zero four zero molar OH. What's the POH of that? We just take the negative log of it. Right? So 0 0.04, and we take the log of that and change the sign. Oh, I did something wrong. Hold on a second. 0 0.04, enter. And then we do the log and change the sign. There we go. So we got two significant figures. That means I get two decimal places. 1.40. POH is 1.40. Okay. Let's see. We're just about just about done. That's good. Good timing. Uh, for the pH of a solution, the pH of a solution is 5.85. What's the OH for this solution? OH minus. All right. So we know that the pOH would be 14 minus 5.85. So we'll do that first. 8.15 is the pOH. Now, what's the OH minus concentration? Well, you need the negative 8.15 and make that the power of 10, like that. And that'll give you your answer. That's the anti-log of negative 8.15. Seven times 10 to the minus of nine molar is your Hydroxyl concentration. Where would you need to do something like that? Well, suppose you were told that a reaction which involves hydroxyl ions is conducted in a solution of a given pH. And in order to solve the stoichiometry of that problem, you need to know the hydroxyl concentration. So you just take the pH convert it to POH, convert that to, take the anti-log of the negative, and now you have your hydroxyl concentration for that reaction. Okay. Um, in this course, we're not going to do uh, hydrogen ion concentrations or pH calculations for weak acids. Because that requires an extra step, an equilibrium uh, method. And that's just beyond this course. But you can calculate pHs for strong acids. It's very easy because a strong acid will completely dissociate. So two molar hydrochloric acid is actually two molar hydrogen ions. Right. So now it's easy. You've got the number of hydrogen ions. You just convert them, convert that to pH. There you go. And notice that this is a negative pH.
Well, actually, what we were asked to do was calculate the hydrogen ion concentration, which is there. But we can also do the pH. Um, Sorensen, when he, when he invented this transformation, um, wasn't interested in these high concentrations. He wanted something that was more physiological. That is something between um, two and 10 or 12, something like that. Uh, I'll be right back in just a second. Short break. Okay. Um, let's see, where was I? Oh. Um, the, how do we measure these concentrations? Well, if you're, if you're looking for hydrogen ion concentrations, you can do what's called a titration. You can use a, a base of known concentration and add it to a solution with hydrogen ions. And uh, you can use an indicator that'll tell you when they're equal. And then you can do calculations and determine the hydrogen ion concentration. But suppose we want a quicker way. Well, we have electronics, we have meters that are designed to measure the hydrogen ion concentration in solution and convert that uh, signal into a number which is is uh, delivered to you as a pH value. Uh, the problem with those meters is that they're only accurate within a certain range, most of them accurate within a certain range and that range is generally two and a half to ten and a half. Anything, any pH below that or above that requires very specialized, what we call electrodes. Those electrodes have to be tuned to the conditions of very low or very high pH. So it can be done. It's just, it's not common and it becomes more expensive because not many people do it. And uh, those electrodes have to be very rugged because the environment, high pH, low pH, the environment is uh, detrimental to the 
survival of the electrode. Okay, let's say we have a solution two times 10 to the minus third molar hydrochloric acid. What's the pH? Well, you know it's a strong acid, so if you know the concentration of HCl, you know the concentration of the uh, hydrogen ions, H. Right. So there you have the hydrogen ion concentration. Then you just take the negative log of that number, and that gives you a pH of 2.70. All right, simple, simple calculation. How about the pH of a 1.5 times 10 to the minus 11th molar solution of HCl? Well, let's see. Um, does it really matter? Let's look at it this way. Remember, the dissociation of water is still there, even though you're adding this acid to it. Right? So... You, you've got this reaction going on. All right? At the same time, and the neutral pH would give this one 10 to the minus 7 molar, and this one 10 to the minus 7 molar, correct? Okay, so if you add um, hydrochloric acid, what is it doing? Well, hydrochloric acid then reacts with water and produces the hydronium plus the OH. All right, so if this is 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5, uh, 11, excuse me, 11, then that means this is also, after this is used up, then we have this and this. Oh, excuse me. That's not right. Uh. There, that's what you have for this reaction. That proton transfers here and gives you this conjugate acid. That leaves as a conjugate base. Okay. So this is also 1.5 times 10 to the minus 11. Okay, notice that the water produces more hydroniums than the added hydrochloric acid by a factor of uh, four, four powers of 10. We call that uh, order of magnitude. It's four orders of magnitude more concentrated. So what effect will this have on the pH? The pH of this solution is still seven. Okay, so only if you add enough acid to exceed that concentration do you get an impact from the added acid on the pH of the solution. Okay, now this one looks like it would do something. 10 to the minus 2. That's five orders of magnitude stronger or higher in value than that. So yeah, it is gonna have an impact. All right. So all we need to do is take the dissociated proton plug it into our formula and we find our pH is 1.82. So that's, that's pretty low pH. Now, 
last concept is buffering. What do we mean by buffering? In chemical terms, and particularly referencing uh, acids and bases, buffered, a buffered solution is one which will maintain very narrow range pH. In other words, if you add acid to a buffer, um, in water you would expect you add acid and the pH will drop in accordance with how much acid you add. With a buffered solution, you add that acid and the pH barely budges. Or you add base, it barely budges the other way. So it resists the change in pH when you add either acid or base. Most buffers are made from weak acids and their conjugate base, a mixture of the two. Notice what happens. If we say, let's use a real, uh, let's use a, a real uh, molecule, acetic acid. And we're going to leave out the water for now. Right, we're just going to dissociate it. Okay, so we have a weak acid making a strong conjugate base, right? Well, we covered that before. Now, what happens if you add acid? Let's say we have, we've let it come to equilibrium. And we've um, mixed the buffer in such a way that you have equal amounts of these two. So if you have X amounts of that, you have X amount of that. Equal amounts. And that's our equilibrium situation. How did we get there? Well, we have acid, but we also added acetate ion independently, like sodium acetate, right? So that we could get equal amounts of the acid and the uh, conjugate base. Okay. It's important that you have that. Now, now that you've got your equilibrium, what happens if you add some of that? If you add some of this acid, that strong base is going to snap up those protons. Right? That, it's a strong base. It wants protons. So it snaps up these protons, not all of them, but most of them, and shifts back over here, that side. So what happens to the pH? Well, the pH is dependent upon those protons. So if you don't have many left in excess, the pH didn't change, did it? All right. What if you add hydroxyl. Remember, water is a weak acid, 10 to the minus 14 K value. That means hydroxyl is a very strong base. So if you add hydroxyl, it's going to combine with those protons. Right? So those protons make water. And now what's going to happen to the equilibrium? Well, when you remove those protons, this dissociates a little more to make up for the difference. Okay, so now the pH didn't change much either, right? It replaced those protons from the weak acid. Okay, that's a buffer. And that's how the buffer works. All right. 
Um, all right, so this is but rehashing what I just told you. Uh, this solution contains a weak acid and its conjugate base. It has to be both of them. And ideally, they're equal in concentrations. Um, I don't have time to explain why, but that's the best buffer where the weak acid and its conjugate base are in equal concentrations. The buffer resists the pH change. Whether you add more acid or add base, it resists the change by Le Chatelier's principle, actually. Any added hydrogen ions react with the strong base, the conjugate base, like that. Any added hydroxyls, um, it says it reacts with the weak acid, but I think it reacts with uh, the protons. And then the shift occurs. So that's a slightly misleading statement. It still works, of course. Okay, if a solution is buffered with ammonia, right? So now we're not using a weak acid. We're using a weak base. And we form the buffer by including the weak base plus its conjugate acid in H4 plus, like that. So what reaction will occur if a strong base such as in a, in a sodium hydroxide is added? Well, it's a strong base. It's going to go for protons. And there are protons attached to this conjugate acid. Right? So you get this one reacting with that one to produce ammonia and water. Okay. Um, so that's the best answer. And it will also stabilize the pH. But each buffer has a different ideal pH. Right? So you can make buffers for very low pHs moderate pHs in the middle, or very high pHs. You just have to choose the weak acid or the weak base uh, correctly. And if you do that, you can establish a, a uh, stable pH for your buffer wherever you want it to be. Now, there's some acids, like um, phosphoric acid, that dissociate three protons, which means you have the option of uh, three conjugate bases. So if you, if you choose which one you want, phosphoric acid can deliver uh, a buffer at three different pHs. We don't have time to discuss it right now. I just wanted to point that out. If you've only got one proton, in your weak acid, then you've only got one possible buffer pH. But if you have more than one, like uh, sulfuric acid wouldn't work because it's a strong acid. Now the second sulfuric, the HSO4 minus, might work as a buffer. But I've never, I've never done the calculations, so I don't know for sure. Anyway, that's the end of that discussion. And that's as far as we can go in introductory chemistry on acids and bases, and you're probably thankful for that. <laughs> we could go a lot deeper, but we just don't have time in this course. It's only one semester, so we'll stop the share. And...